Good morning, my wonderful free melons. Thank you for joining me here on the Free Melon Society. Once again, I'm Eli Martyr. Today, we're going to be looking at the concept of immunity. This is going to be a shorter video, and I've already dealt with immunity in many of my other videos, but I thought it would be helpful to make a shorter video that kind of focuses right on the concept of immunity. And the reason I want to do this is because we hear the concept of boosting immunity being thrown around virtually everywhere in the health community. Jump onto any search engine of your choice and plug in any food, virtually any food that you are interested in finding out more information about. And inevitably what you'll find is if they are touting the health benefits of that food, they list the boosting of the immune system or the immune enhancing function of that food is a boon that you will be gifted if you take that food into your diet. So I wanted to make a short video and just focus on that so that we can get our thinking straight around this concept of immunity. Okay, so sit tight and let's get into it. So medically speaking, immunity, I'm sure you could find lots of definitions of, of immunity, but generally speaking, immunity is likely going to be described as some sort of constitutional insulation against infectious disease matter, all right? The organism's ability, capacity to be either completely or relatively safeguarded from the illness-inducing effects of infectious agents. The concept that we have of immunity is like a battlefield, all right? We imagine immunity to be some state whereby we have an internal army, a reservoir of biological shock troopers, and their goal and their task is nothing short of defending the body and defending the constitution from the onslaught of inevitably invading monsters and pathogens and microbes and bacterias and yeasts that come flooding into the body from every single imaginable, imaginable orifice. And the only way to defend effectively against this preponderance of pathogens is by the strength and number of the soldiers that we have at our available that constitute our own personal immune army, okay? So that, that's the conception that we have. And so if two people are afflicted or inoculated with some pathogen, when I say pathogen, all I mean is the disease causing agent or microbe, okay, the pathogen. Now, as we'll see, pathogen, <laughs> Microbes do not cause diseases. Bacteria don't cause diseases. There is no such thing as contagion of viruses. These are just non-terms. But in the medical conventional understanding, right, that's what we mean when we say pathogen, okay? So the difference between two people who are equally exposed to the presence of some floating pathogen, okay, would be in the conventional medical understanding, that one person, uh, let's just say person A gets sick and person B does not, then what we understand from that is that person B had a stronger immune system. So basically they either had more shock troops, so we just, <laughs> we just, we just outnumber the amount of microbes and we, and we take them down, um, or maybe we have better weaponry stronger tools to be able, you know, so not necessarily more, more army personnel, but we have stronger tools with which to blow them away, right? We have more nukes, more guns, more machine guns, whatever it is. And so this person B has the stronger immune system. And so they're able to blow away the pathogens and person uh, A, if they get sick, they succumb, they succumb to the, to the disease. Okay, because they didn't have a strong enough army. This war mentality, this constant war condition uh, is a complete fabrication. All right, it is, it is a complete departure from reality. The way your actual immune system works is nothing of the sort. Okay, it does not look like that. The way your immune system actually works or is actually structured is much more like a kingdom, get rid of the invading army, it's just the kingdom. And the way the kingdom runs, when it runs smoothly and efficiently, 
is that all the inhabitants of the kingdom are happy, the rulers of the kingdom are happy, and they're benevolent, and they're good, and they're intelligent, and they're wise, okay, and they look after their subjects. And all of the byproducts of running a kingdom, the waste material, okay, because the kingdom is run well, all of those byproducts are eliminated from the kingdom expeditiously and efficiently, and garbage doesn't pile high on the streets, the kingdom is clean, the halls are kept in order, the houses are kept in order, everything is well maintained, and you have a well-functioning kingdom, okay? So disease, in this case, would come from any influence that causes the kingdom to not be able to effectively eliminate all the waste products and byproducts of running a kingdom. And that would be the cause of trouble. And you see, what starts to make much more sense is that if we are interested in maintaining and preserving health, then what we should do is we should study and understand the conditions that produce health, right? We, in, in order to get health, we want to understand and reproduce healthy things and that which keeps us healthy, not that which is disease producing or gets us sick. Right? See, in, in the previous understanding of immunity, the kind of medical model of the war, the war mentality, evil microbes and, you know, the, the, the army at the gates defending against the microbes. In that model, we believe that in order to become immune to an illness that is supposedly caused by the invading pathogens, what you must do is you must either succumb to the disease that those pathogens are supposed to cause, right? So get sick. And then on the other end of the sickness, your body learns, oh, this is what this pathogen is like. These are its characteristics. Okay, so now next time I'm met with these pathogens, I can defend myself, all right? Or the medical model says we take the sickness inducing pathogens from another organism that is already sick and we introduce it into the body of a healthy person. And so introducing disease into the healthy person is going to be what produces health, right? So it's a complete, it's a completely different understanding. And in this case, one is wrong, one is right. See, and we know this because there are many problems with that medical assumption of, of how immunity works. And this is review from other videos, but in a violation of Koch's postulates, if a microbe is in fact the cause of disease, then it has to cause that disease in every single person that it comes in contact with. If it doesn't, then some other explanation is forthcoming. You also can't have a flourishing of that organism in the body of healthy individuals because that would make no sense right? If the thing is supposed to cause disease and it's running rampant and free in the body of a healthy person, well, it can't be the cause of disease. And that's exactly what we see in reality when we study people, when we observe people. Additionally, we also notice that the medical literature is still a bit confused as to when getting a disease causes or creates immunity to that disease in the future and when it doesn't. So something like chickenpox, for example, we see that chickenpox is less likely to occur in adulthood and in childhood much more likely. Now that's for many reasons, one being in childhood, chickenpox tends to develop when the child is undergoing growth spurts. And so there's a whole a cascade of hormonal byproducts that need to be purged from the system because they're being used. And if the child has a lifestyle that is additionally burdening, burdening the child with lots of undue influences from the outside, then the body can get overrun and then chicken pox. And then later on in adulthood, because you're not in a growth spurt anymore, the, the way disease manifests is just becomes different in adulthood, right? So in chicken pox, it looks like getting it once made you immune to a future infection when you're an adult. That, that's not what's happening, but that's what we think we see. But then something like influenza, for example, you get it once, there's no guarantee that you won't get it again. You can get influenza, you, the flu, you can get the flu many, 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 many times over. 
all right? Getting it once does not prevent you from getting it again. And of course, that makes sense because the body doesn't work like that. It's not microbes and pathogens that your body has to flag and identify and learn from, and then it safeguards the body from being defeated by that organism in the future. That's not how it works. The way it actually does work is in fact the very bacteria and yeasts and pathogens and the candidas and all the microbes that we think are the enemy, the thing that our immune system has to shoot down right, guarding the gates, those things are in fact the very same army that we need in order to become well. It is that invading army that is in fact our own endogenous immune system. So the concept is completely backwards. Imagine how silly it would be for me to engage in a night of callous, reckless, unfettered imbibition of alcohol and then get sick the subsequent day. Maybe I throw up violently, next day I've got a hangover. Okay, so I go and do that. Imagine how dumb it would be for me to believe that I have now safeguarded myself against the hangover and the vomiting associated with alcohol intake the next time I decide to do that. Well, that'd be ridiculous because it, because if you continue to poison yourself, then your body will be forced to clean itself, to cleanse itself by using those very same agents, the bacteria and the, the viruses and the, and the funguses and the yeasts and the molds and all, and all of these things are cleansing agents in the body. And so we need them in order. They are the cure, right? So we need them in order to deal with our bad lifestyle choices. So, what are the three factors, the, fr the three great factors that determine your level of immunity to illness? And you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that I, I can barely think of any other person besides myself. I know there's lots of you out there. I'm just saying me personally and my circle of, of friends and family. I know almost nobody can't think of anyone in particular right now who didn't go through some sort of cleansing reaction in the in the fake fear campaign that was orchestrated in 2020 2021 no facial halloween costumes no honoring or respecting any safety protocols that were promulgated in the medical literature spent as much time in big crowds as i possibly could surely exposed myself to an outrageous amount of pathogens in the air. Is it a coincidence that I live the way I live and I was perfectly fine throughout the whole thing and that still to this day since starting this lifestyle my body hasn't felt the need to come down with any sort of sickness or illness or influenza of any sort? I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence. I made a video a while back on the times I have gotten sick, but it wasn't because of the random cold or the random flu. Like that stuff doesn't happen to me. But if I gorge on a 1 million calorie fat rich meal, for example, then you definitely feel the effects of that and it's, and it's not great. Um, but you know, the, the, the cause and effect are, are in that sense, very, very, very obvious. And so it's like, oh, okay. So this experiment and this little indulgence, this makes me feel like crap. So obviously we don't do it again. So that type of thing. But in terms of what we commonly think of as coming down with the cold, coming down with the flu, yeah, no, that stuff just, that stuff doesn't happen. All right, so there are three major factors, okay, that determine your level of immunity. So we're gonna go through these really, really quickly now. Number one is the amount of nervous energy, of nerve energy, of electrical energy that the individual has at their disposal. You have a finite amount of energy that you have available to you every single day. And if you live in such a way that calls for your body to use its energy to do too many different tasks, such that there is not enough energy left in order to run your elimination organs properly or your, your ability to eliminate the waste products associated with living. If you deplete that energy too much and too often, you will get sick. 
because your, your ability to eliminate waste products will be impaired. And that is one of the major reasons why someone would get sick and is one of the major reasons that affect your immunity. And this is just review. I'm, the, you can find this in other videos, um, but I just want to just quickly go through the three major factors that contribute to your immunity. Now, we know that digestion is the most expensive metabolic function in the body. And so it becomes very important what you put into your body because if you tax yourself too much, then it can cause problems. But of course, how much stress you have, how much you exercise, are you over-exercising, are you getting enough sleep, probably the most important thing, right? How much sleep did you get the night prior or the week prior? How much electromagnetic chaos are you subjected to? On and on it goes, right? All of these things can tax your body's vital energy. Right, your ner uh, nerve energy, I say nerve energy, like your electrical energy. So being able to effectively and efficiently moderate your levels of vital energy, right, of nervous energy, meaning don't overtax yourself, essentially. Being able to do that will be very helpful in ensuring that you uh, keep yourself in good working order and that you'll be immune, <laughs> okay, immune from illness and disease. The second factor Two. that determines your level of immunity is the quality of your blood, right? The quality of your blood, the quality of your blood cells. How free from acidic wastes are the other fluids of the body, all right? The fluids that bathe and coat the cells. Does your body have to laboriously fight and strive to alkalize those body fluids to keep your blood at that very stable 7.53 uh, pH, excuse me? because your blood can't deviate from that point on the pH scale, otherwise you die. So how hard are you making your body work to keep your, your blood at that place? If it doesn't have to work very hard, it doesn't have to buffer lots of acids in your, in your body fluids, then, then you'll conserve energy. If it has to work really hard to do that, then you'll deplete more energy. But in terms of the actual blood itself, all right, well, what does your blood look like? Are the blood cells themselves healthy? What do the walls of the endothelium look like? Are they damaged from waste products polluting the bloodstream? Is the blood loaded with fatty masses because you're eating too many fat-rich foods and processed junk foods and rancified fats and free radicals? I mean, all this garbage that can pollute the bloodstream. Your body has to really fight hard to keep that bloodstream pristine. And so the quality of your blood, the quality of your blood cells, that is going to also determine um, how well you are insulated from coming down with illnesses and disease. And the last and third factor Three. that determines your level of immunity is the quality of your organs themselves. Now, sometimes over time, what happens is we actually cause structural damage to our organs. Our kidneys, our pancreas, our liver, our gallbladder, appendix, right? People get their appendixes removed, right? People get their tonsils removed because these organs get overburdened by pollution associated with our lifestyle. And so if our actual machinery, if the gear that our bodies are working with become impaired, well, you can imagine what the problem would be with that, right? The organ can't function. It's been vitiated to the point of becoming a derelict organ, only yearning one day to finally be able to convalesce and reclaim its lost glory. But this is the problem, right? Because if we continue to do the things that harm us, then the organs get compromised, and so we can have this never-ending negative cycle negative feedback loop. So in terms of immunity, so this is, this is it. This is the, this is the key here. When we're talking about immunity and your immune system, your immune system, your immune function, what, how it really works is your immune system is your whole body. Your immune system is the entire kingdom, all right? Your immune system is you, is your mind, all right? And how you command the vessel, command the lifestyle. That is what keeps you healthy and well. What you allow into the kingdom, how you run your kingdom, this is your immune system. And whether your system has to hire and take on the, the agency of viruses, bacteria, candida, yeasts, mold, fungi, algaes, all these growths, 
and microbes that your body produces of its own tissues. Okay, whether your your body has to deal with those depends on how well you effectively run your your kingdom. And in order to run your kingdom properly, you need an ample nerve supply, a constant ample nerve supply, never becoming whittled down in your reserves. Your blood needs to be clean and free and clear of pollution, and the organs need to be maintained in proper functioning. If those three things are happening, you are going to be immune from disease. Now, the last thing to briefly mention is what about autoimmune diseases? What's happening with autoimmune diseases where we see that the body is quote unquote attacking itself, right? So what's really happening there? And even with the concept of autoimmunity, if you peruse the medical literature, you're, you're going to find a, a recurring theme. And that recurring theme is we have no idea what causes etiology unknown. Autoimmune disease is, is still a complete mystery. Autoimmunity is the idea that the human body has this army, okay, this, this immune army, and it can get confused and it can turn the guns on its own troops and start blah, 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 and start blowing them away. And then it never stops doing that for whatever reason and you have an autoimmune disease. Uh, really great book, What Really Makes You Ill by Don Lester and David Parker. There's a chapter on autoimmunity. And I'll read you a couple of passages from the book. It would seem, therefore, that according to the medical establishment, the human body is not only a passive receptacle that is attacked by disease, but it also makes mistakes and is capable of self-destruction. Nothing could be further from the truth. The medical establishment theories relating to autoimmune diseases are fraught with problems, the main one of which is that these theories are dependent upon erroneous ideas about the immune system, the existence of which is predicated upon the germ theory, a theory that has been shown to be fatally flawed. Uh, skipping ahead here, on the NIAMS, National Institute of Arthritis, Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases webpage, entitled Autoimmune Diseases, it states that, quote, no one is sure what causes autoimmune diseases. The theories underlying autoimmunity were recognized to be problematic more than two decades ago by Dr. Peter Duesberg, who states in his 1996 book, Inventing the AIDS Virus, that, quote, the autoimmunity hypothesis, however, suffers several fatal flaws. He proceeds to explain some of those flaws. For one thing, autoimmune reactions have been poorly documented in any disease, not to mention AIDS. In fact, they may never occur in an otherwise healthy person. Moreover, the immune system works so well precisely because it has built in, but poorly understood, safeguards that prevent it from attacking its own host body. In dealing with autoimmunity, it would seem that what we need to do is we need to be able to identify all of the, besides food, there's so many other factors here, all of the different ways that we can subject undue influence and poisonous influences to our bodies that cause damage. Because what you find is that there are many types of different drugs or pharmaceuticals that can induce autoimmune-like symptoms in a person. So essentially, you can poison a person or an animal with, with drugs and create the exact same spectrum of autoimmune, uh, autoimmune disease symptoms that you would see in someone with what is classified as an autoimmune disorder. See, a lot of times we are a neurological diabetic. I'll give you an example, and this is an interesting case. A lady came in the other day, 50 years old, and she had hurt her knee, her left knee, and she had had uh, a surgical repair of that, and something went wrong, I don't know, but well, after the third surgery, she went into type 1 diabetes and she stopped menstruating. Now, this is very significant. Why? The answer is anesthesia is a neurotoxin. What it did, it suppressed the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and she couldn't produce insulin properly anymore. We have to wake up to what neurotoxins are, and they're everywhere. They're pesticides, herbicides, certain perfumes, uh, deodorizers for bathrooms. Uh, the list is long. And now she's came to us, and now she's rebuilding tissue again. She's fixing her nervous system, and now she's back normal again. And then some autoimmune disorders, like type 2, uh, excuse me, type 1 diabetes, for example, which is said to be incurable, well, there are instances where it is curable. I mean, what can we do? We have practitioners that have cured people of type 1 diabetes.
Now, of course, uh, depending on how long the person has been dealing with type 1 diabetes, that, that is for sure a relevant factor in whether treatment's going to be effective or not in, in completely reversing type 1. All forms of diabetes can be drastically and vastly improved. Type 2 is much, much more easily reversed. Type 1 is a little bit trickier to deal with. But we also can't say that it's incurable because it's, it's happened before. So, anyhow. Well, if you're not adequately producing enough uh, insulin, then you would want to, you would, you would, it makes sense to have a sugar that didn't require insulin. And there is one, and that's fruit sugar. All our diabetics type 1 goes on a fruit diet. You can show where you can go on an exclusively fruit diet, eat a salad, and your blood sugar will go up from the salad because you're not carrying that glucose into a cell. You have insulin production problems. So you always want to be on fruits. At least you'll get ATP, even if you glucose load a little bit. Because when you break down your fat, you're going to glucose load a little bit. Type 1 uh, di uh, diabetes should always be on fruit. Fruit, fruit, fruit. If you go up a little higher in blood sugar, just observe that. You'll probably glucose load for a while as you break down the fat in the body. And uh, if you're having vegetables with fruit, you might see an upswing of, of glucose. But ultimately, you will see your blood uh, sugar levels drop. And when you do, you be careful what you're taking. If you're on insulin or macrophage or some type of, uh, of uh, hormone there for that, you must be very careful. Yes, type 1 is a more genetic problem, no question about it. You notice most people that have type 1 are younger. However, you, this one case of this 50-year-old shows you just that neurological compromising of the nervous system. Always keep your diet to fresh fruits and vegetables. If you have to have some cooked vegetables, okay. Stay away from protein. Stay definitely away from fats. When you have blood sugar problems, you never do starch. That's complex sugar. Starch is polysaccharide. Fruits and vegetables are mono sugars. Simple sugars. You have to have a sugar. Can't starve your body for a sugar because when you damage cells, this is going to become more serious. Just wanted to focus on that in one particular video. Sometimes it's just helpful to have a dedicated video so you can see it in the content page of the channel. So hopefully that helps. If you find that you're liking the content here on the channel, then of course subscribe. Uh, you don't want to miss other videos that I do release in the future. If you want to connect with other free melons, other free melon initiates who have started this process, who've got some experience now living this type of lifestyle that results in perpetual immunity then join the Facebook group okay you can head over to Facebook and you can uh, search for the free melon uh, the free melon society group and you can join the group and there are other other like-minded individuals there that will support one another so anyway that's it for now guys I love you very much thank you so much for everything and we'll see you next time here in the secret classroom on the free melon society okay bye bye guys